Welcome to the WREL Daily Download. I'm Jack Hagel. As election season heats up, North Carolina Republicans are hoping to flip one of the nation's longest-held Democratic congressional seats. The district that stretches from the edge of the triangle to the northeastern part of the state could be one of the most competitive districts in North Carolina in November, and GOP candidates are locked in a contentious battle for their party's nomination. WRAL state government reporter Paul Spey has been exploring the race, and he joins us now to break it all down. Paul, welcome back. Thanks for having me back. Now, before we dive down to the district level, let's talk about the state's congressional delegation as a whole. It's expected to become a little bit more lopsided after November, right? That's right. We have 14 congressional seats, and right now there is an even split. There are seven Republicans and seven Democrats. Now, why would that change in 2024? Well, because last year, Republican uh, legislators redrew the state's congressional maps as well as the legislative maps in a way that will give them an advantage. They can win, uh, they're expected to win 10 seats, and they could win as many as 11, uh, depending on what happens in November. Now you may ask, what, why this year? Why all of a sudden are the maps changing? They usually are redrawn every 10 years, uh, but a series of court decisions allowed the legislators to redraw them again last year. And that's where we are. Now, whether it's 10-4 or 11-3 could depend on the first congressional district. This is a traditionally Democratic district, but now a Republican actually has a chance there. What changed? Uh, well, it's geographically huge, and uh, it has lots of rural vo- voters and lots of minority voters. Uh, for 30 years, it's been represented by a Democrat. But Republicans change the map so that uh, it brings in more conservative voters. You know, the Democrat who won it in 2022 won by four percentage points. Uh, After the maps were redrawn, it included uh, voters who supported Ted Budd, Republican Ted Budd in the Senate race uh, by two percentage points. And if the maps were in place back in 2020, Joe Biden would have only won it by less than one percentage percent uh, under the current map. So it's it's gone from, you know, a four point Democratic uh, advantage to, you know, somewhere between zero and two points. I mean, that is a small margin for error uh, for someone r- running on the Democratic side. Now, the incumbent in the district is Democrat Don Davis. He doesn't face a challenger in the primaries. How vulnerable is he in November? Well, he is new to the seat in that he only won it in 2022 after uh, G.K. Butterfield retired. Now, Butterfield was there, oh gosh, ages it feels like. I mean, he he had this name recognition forever. Uh, Davis, he's been mayor of Snow Hill. He was a state senator for, I believe, six terms. Uh, And now he's been up there for one. He has some name recognition, but... Uh, not not as much clout to work with as Butterfield did. So uh, one thing that he does have is the ability to say, hey, I am not a rubber stamp for the Democratic Party. I am not Joe Biden. I am not, you know, doing his bidding on, you know, on every bill. Uh, in interviews with us, uh, he talked about his high scores from third party groups for being able to reach across the aisle and find common ground. There's a group called Common Ground, something or another. And um, he's considered someone that uh, looks for bipartisanship. And he talks about that when you talk to him. He's, you know, he voted with Republicans um, to try to preserve gas stoves, you know, uh, protect them from a federal ban. He has been to the border. He talks about the need uh, for more border security. Uh, and he's also uh, pushed back on the Biden administration's proposal to ban menthol cigarettes. He says, hey, I'm all for promoting good health, but it could potentially affect 6,000 jobs in North Carolina, and we're not offering any plan to replace those. So he's been an outspoken opponent of that. So he's running as a moderate. That's what he's doing. He was he was somewhat of a moderate in, uh, the when he was a state senator, but uh, he's, he's vocal about it on the campaign trail uh, for re-election. Well, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll hear about the GOP candidates in the 1st Congressional District. Stick around. Welcome back to the WREL Daily Download. We're talking with WREL state government reporter Paul Spey about the upcoming congressional primary elections in North Carolina. Paul, now that the 1st Congressional District is more competitive for Republicans, there's a heated battle for the GOP nomination. Who's in the running? 
It's Sandy Smith and Lori Buckout. And now, if if the name Sandy Smith sounds familiar, that's because she ran for the district in 2020 and 2022, winning the Republican primary both times uh, before losing to the Democrat. So uh, she's got some name recognition there. She is also a big Trump supporter, sort of on the MAGA side of the party. And she's up against Lori Buckout, who is a uh, military veteran, business owner who started her own defense uh, consulting firm, uh, who moved to the district in 2021. Her and her husband now live in Edenton. She is seen sort of, to use a military term, as reinforcements uh, by some in the district uh, because Sandy Smith, A, she lost twice. And along the way, she faced criticism for some personal issues. There are allegations out there that she uh, got violent with two ex-husbands. Uh, there are allegations that she abused her daughter. She denies all of this and said it's it's blown way out of proportion and that these attacks are, are sort of been uh, ramped up just to derail her campaign. Uh, but uh, Republican insiders I've spoken with say, hey, you know, the reason Buckout is in this race is because powerful Republicans believe Sandy Smith can't get her campaign over the finish line. And so Buckout is considered this uh, more polished candidate. And that's sort of the, the air she gives off, too, when you speak to her. She's very pro- she has a professional background. Uh, she made it up to Colonel. And she's sort of a no-nonsense candidate. Well, in interviews with us and out on the campaign trail, they are, they are going at it. They are bringing up these personal attacks. You know, Sandy Smith says, yeah, I faced this stuff about you know, uh, alleged abuse, but, uh, Buckout, uh, was, uh, arrested for drunk driving in Georgia a few years ago, which is true. And Buckout acknowledges she made a mistake. Uh, but Sandy Smith says, Hey, I'm not the only one with liabilities here. So what we see is two candidates, both who support Trump, both who claim to be conservative fighters. One, branding herself as the more grassroots candidate and Smith and the other in saying, Hey, you don't have to worry about me. I'm not a liability. You know, I have all this experience in the military and working with people in Washington. I'm the one who can get across the finish line. That's what's happening in this primary. Now Smith has won twice. So she has that going for her. And in 2022, Trump endorsed her. Trump hasn't endorsed her this time around. What changed, and can that help her or hurt her? I think the answer to that question depends on how closely you pay attention to this race. Uh, If you're familiar with the candidates and Sandy Smith's history uh, and the political landscape in this primary, you may say, oh, this is a sign that Trump doesn't believe she can win. And you might think that because it's it's well known across the country in political circles, Trump likes to endorse winners. And so when he when he does give an endorsement, it's because he thinks they have a shot at winning, not just because he likes them for their personality. Now, it, in this case, in this primary, uh, one reason I think it, it my personal opinion is it may not matter because Trump did not move his support. He did not move it to buck out. So what you have now is a candidate in Sandy Smith who has pictures of Trump. Uh, on, on her website, uh, there were articles written about Trump endorsing her last time. You know, she's very much, if you look at her campaign materials and listen to her speak, she's very much uh, Trump branded, if you will. Now, Buckout is a Trump supporter as well. She voted for him, she says, four times, uh, and she thinks uh, she supports his agenda. But uh, Smith, you know, to the average, vo- the average voter may not be able to tell that Smith lost anything by Trump not showing up this time around. We'll see. We'll see. Well, if Trump's not getting involved, who is throwing their weight around? Is anybody showing up for Buckout? Well, there's a dark money group called uh, the Congressional Leadership Fund, and it's endorsed by the top Republicans in the House. Now, that's that does make them special uh, and influential, and they're throwing their support behind Buckout. Uh, to date, I believe they've uh, spent about 180 grand on that on uh, supporting her campaign, and some people see that as a sign. Like, hey, they don't typically get involved in primaries. You know, big super PACs don't 
always it, it's not common it's not uncommon but it's not common either for for big super PACs with ties to leadership uh getting involved in primaries but in this case they they are and uh smith's critics say hey that's that's a sign that uh powerful republicans think that that buck out has a better shot at beating davis than smith does now president biden's approval ratings really aren't great right now could that alone turn the tide here if this race is going to be so close it could. It just means that uh, Don Davis will have to do more work and spend more money uh, to get his own unique message out there so that uh, his opponents can't successfully tie him to the quote unquote Biden agenda and, um, you know, liberal Democrats. Um, he is Biden is polling in a weaker position now than he was at the same time uh, back in 2020. So that is a concern. Of course, you know, uh, it. it we shouldn't judge too early either because the attack ads haven't started yet. You know, this is very early in the campaign. So, you know, once the the Democratic and Republican groups really ramp up, we don't know what attacks will hit the hardest. They will. They will make a difference, the the political attack ads on, on our own airwaves. Um, but we don't know how much it'll swing it. So uh, that, that's a long way of saying uh, Biden could very well drag down Davis. But... He has a plan to separate himself from the Biden agenda. And, you know, Biden's poll position will essentially determine how much he has to spend and how hard he has to work to get his own unique campaign message out there. Now, once the dust settles after the primaries, what does the messaging look like on the Republican side, on the Democratic side in the general election in this district? Well, Republicans are going to try to tie Davis to Biden, and he's going to try to separate himself and go around the district saying, hey, I'm I'm he used the word native son in an interview with me. I am a native son and I've served in the military. He did. He served in the Air Force. He taught at East Carolina University uh, and he, he says he knows the voters. He's going to go around saying, don't worry about Biden. Look at me. You know me. You know, just look at my record. That's essentially what he told us in his interview. Now, what remains to be seen is, will he uh, start getting aggressive with his Republican opponent? Uh, in, in his interview with us, he declined to comment on uh, Buckout or Smith or whether he had a preference or anything like that. He said, what I know is this district needs someone who's familiar with, uh, with their needs as well as someone who can navigate the complex waters of Washington. And he, he pointed out, He's been bringing home the bacon, uh, to put it, uh, you know, uh, in a very cliche way. Uh, even in a, his first term, one where they you know, ousted a speaker, they censured three of the members, they expelled George Santos, and uh, you know, there's been all this chaos. And he, uh, the the example he gave me was that he brought 1.4 million dollars to a tourist attraction, and the least populated county in the state. So a, f- a county that presumably no politician would really care about. Here he is getting federal funding uh, for their boardwalk and at, at a time when uh, maybe no one would have expected that. So uh, that's what he's going to talk about, whether he attacks, you know, Buckout or Smith, whoever it is, um, someone will have to do it. It's either going to be the, the Democratic PACs that support him or it'll be him. But I suspect he'll try to keep his uh, keep himself clean of, of that of the more nasty rhetoric. Sort of rise above the fray. That's right. Well, I know that we'll all be watching closely. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. That's WRL State Government reporter Paul Spey. For his profile of the first congressional district primary, go to the NC Capital section of WRL.com. I'm Jack Hagel. Thanks for joining us and thanks for listening to the WRL Daily Download and for making us part of your morning routine. Another great way to get WRL news is the Morning Briefing newsletter. It's a daily email that arrives in your inbox every morning with triangle news, events, and headlines to help you get ready for the day. Sign up at wral.com newsletter.